Dr. Becky Strawbridge, thanks very much for joining us. It's lovely to meet you. It's lovely to meet you too. Glad to be here. I've been very much enjoying reading some of your papers this year. And to me, your research ticks several boxes. It addresses something that I see as being important and burdensome, but also somewhat neglected. And it seems that you have some talent and motivation to make some meaningful progress. So thank you very much for the work that you do. And thanks for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you. That's very kind of you. I thought it might be fun and hopefully helpful to begin with a series of rapid fire questions about lithium just to warm up. So I'm going to challenge you to see if you can keep each answer to a sentence or less. And this is notoriously difficult for academics. But if we start with some basics, what is lithium? And where does the lithium in foods and drinks come from? Lithium is um, a chemical element. It's a mineral salt, very similarly to sodium. Um, it's the lightest solid element. And it was one of the first three elements known to exist back in the Big Bang, along with hydrogen and helium. That's already too long, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the lithium is naturally present in um, rocks and water. So from those rocks comes water and from that water, which goes into the food supply and so on, lithium ends up in foods. Okay, next question. I'll preface this question by saying that when we talk about doses of lithium, we speak about elemental lithium, and that is the total amount of lithium itself and not the amount of lithium plus whatever the lithium is bound to. So for example, lithium carbonate is about 19% lithium and therefore 19 milligrams of elemental lithium comes from 100 milligrams of lithium carbonate. So if we use elemental lithium, then how would you define different doses of lithium based on elemental lithium as opposed to blood levels? That's a great question. So I would categorize them down from trace lithium, which I would say is sort of up to um, perhaps one milligram of lithium, I would call trace. Um, so then we've got microdose lithium, which is from about one milligram up to, say, 20 milligrams of lithium. Then I would talk about low dose lithium, which can still be used as a medication. Um, which would be something like 20 milligrams up to 40 perhaps um, and above 40 we would talk about high dose lithium which is frequently uh, used in medication. Per litre of drinking water what's about the highest dose of lithium that someone might consume in a part of the world with lithium rich water such as Chile or Argentina? I think it's about two milligrams per litre. And what about a mineral water? I know there have been some analyses where they've taken waters, sold in shops and analysed them and found some, at times, freakishly high concentrations. Yeah, so in general, that would be broadly the same um, as water that you find because it's mineral water. But yeah, I think there is one that was possibly, I might be wrong, I think it was about nine milligrams per litre. So that's very high. Um, but like you said, sort of, that's a very rare um, lithium rich mineral water. And since many of our listeners are in the UK and the US, roughly how much lithium per day might someone consume on average in those countries who's not taking lithium as a medication? If you're in a one of those very rare places that has that sort of maximum of one or two milligrams per litre, if you're drinking two litres of water today, um, per day and perhaps eating local food, which is grown, therefore, in, in soil, which has more lithium. Um, you might consume up to five milligrams of lithium per day, as a guess. And if we define trace doses as one milligram or less, like you said, should anybody have any concerns about the safety of trace dose lithium? So there have been some um, studies done looking at um, lithium levels in a population and various things that, that might be associated. There haven't been any concerns raised um, about um, environmental lithium levels in, in high areas. Do you think that trace doses of lithium could have meaningful health benefits for the general population? 
It's really hard to tell. I mean, there have been some really interesting studies. So um, a study that we did looked at the all of the data that we could find um, on environmental trace dose lithium in different populations. And we found that overall or above a certain amount, um, suicide rates um, are lower in areas that have higher trace lithium. Um, there have also been some studies that have possibly linked that higher trace lithium to reduced dementia rates, reduced homicide rates um, as the main ones. So this is possible. I would caveat it to say there are some limitations to that research, but um, but yeah, possible. We will come back to those. Hmm. Um, we will also come back to the goal to keep the answers to the questions to one sentence or less. No problem yeah. whatsoever. <laughs> There's been some interest in the potential of lithium as a so-called geroprotective agent, so something that extends lifespan and or health span. Might lithium make me live forever? We do not have evidence that lithium might make you live forever. God damn it. Okay, that but is, is it generally... <laughs> Very good. But is it generally true that people who drink more lithium live longer? We don't have strong evidence to support that, but... I agree. Yes. Do you think that lithium intake is really inversely related to risk of suicide? And if so, up to what kind of dose level? Possibly. It's really hard to determine up to what level because there are so many factors involved in suicide. Um, but yeah, I would say possibly there is support for that. For the general adult population, um, let's take somebody who weighs 70 kilograms. What do you think the optimal daily lithium intake might be roughly? It definitely depends on the person, but it's been suggested that in terms as a micronutrient or possible micronutrient, one milligram per day would be a sort of nutritional benefit uh, level of lithium. And which clinical populations do you think are most likely to benefit from trace doses of lithium specifically? I think that looking at people who have um, who are getting older and are experiencing cognitive decline or difficulties with memory and things like that is one population. Um, another is people who are sort of at risk, maybe, of developing um, a mood disorder like depression or bipolar disorder, or who have some symptoms of those illnesses but don't have a full um, diagnosis. Are you for or against the idea of standardising lithium concentrations in drinking water? I don't have a strong view either way. There are definitely potential benefits and challenges to thinking about that. I wouldn't have a strong view that that should be done. And what about the idea of fortifying food with lithium, much as the way that salt has been fortified with iodine in some parts of the world? This has been suggested for sure, and I think it's actually quite a good idea, um, particularly because that gives people a level of choice over whether they wish to consume lithium enriched food or not, which you wouldn't have if, you know, like you said, water levels were standardized. Is lithium on some level stigmatized? Yes. Very punchy. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any concerns related to lithium from man-made products leaching into the biosphere? I have to be honest, it's not something that I know a lot about or have looked into, um, which makes me think that there isn't good evidence for that, but I wouldn't care to be absolutist about it. Okay, final question of the not very rapid fire round is, <laughs> other than carbonate and citrate, which are prescription medications, which two or three lithium salts do you think are most likely to be safe and efficacious if we're thinking about supplemental trace dose lithium? To answer briefly, I would say lithium orotate um, and possibly lithium aspartate. Fantastic. Well, rapid fire round over. The clock is no longer ticking, so feel free to elaborate on your answers more. One of the things that you mentioned in there is that some people have put forward the suggestion that lithium is a micronutrient and have therefore suggested daily doses, like that one milligram dose for a 70 kilogram person. What do you think about the idea that lithium might be a micronutrient? Would you agree with that perspective or disagree with it? I think because lithium does, as we've sort of said, have 
health extending properties, possibly some, you know, life extending properties in some scenarios. Um, and given what we know about how it works biologically, um, so for example, one of lithium's biological effects might be stimulating the transport of other vitamins, particularly B12 and folic acid into the brain. So sort of making those perhaps more um, more effective. Um, I would say, although perhaps I am biased, that um, lithium could be considered a micronutrient. I suppose the pushback against that would be that there's no known function that the body needs lithium for, but that's not to say that consuming modest doses of lithium isn't good for health and might not let you go above and beyond where you could go without it. And I suppose that the same could be said for some other nutraceuticals, things like lutein and zeaxanthin and ergothionine come to mind. Since much of your work has focused on mental health specifically, I'd like to turn to lithium and mental health and ill health, starting with mood disorders. And lithium, of course, is often used in bipolar disorder specifically. Some listeners will probably have quite a good understanding of that, but others won't. So can you give a brief synopsis of what bipolar is and the way that we commonly split it into different types? Sure. So bipolar disorder is a mood disorder, or we usually call it an affective disorder, which sort of brings together um, difficulties with mood and activity or energy. Um, and the by of bipolar disorder is, is suggesting that um, there are two poles to those difficulties. So a person with bipolar disorder will sometimes have periods where their mood and or energy are um, very, very upregulated. Um, overactive, um, people will have grandiosity, impulsivity, distractibility, euphoria, to such an extent that that is um, an unwell and risky state to be in. That's called mania. And sometimes these people will experience uh, the opposite, really. So low mood, low energy, and other related symptoms, which are known as depression, which people might be more familiar with. And I guess it's important to say that people with bipolar disorder are not always in one of those two states. So those episodes are interspersed with periods where people are well. And shall I talk about how that relates to lithium? No, I wouldn't worry about that just yet. But okay. I was thinking more about the distinction between bipolar one and two. And then I know that also people speak about psychothymic disorder. And then there are probably other bipolar phenotypes that don't really fit neatly into any of those three others? Yes, yeah, exactly. So that state called mania that I was talking about is, is sort of characteristic of what we call bipolar type 1. Um, other people will have bipolar type 2 where they still have episodes um, of this sort of overactivity, grandiosity, distractibility, you know, racing thoughts. However, those episodes are not as risky um you know people can still function quite well when they're when they're experiencing those symptoms and that's called hypomania which sort of means under mania and that's um so people with type 2 bipolar will have these uh, periods of hypomania and periods of depression um and then as you said there's um cyclothymic disorder or cyclothymia um, which is a really interesting one because essentially describing a person who has periods that include these symptoms of um, mania and of depression, but those are far more um, brief and often um, are interspersed. And really the diagnosis of cyclothymia is fairly rare because according to the diagnostic manuals, uh, cyclothymic disorder a person would have had to have not had a full episode which would be a two week or more episode of depression or a full episode which would be at least five or seven days of manic symptoms so a full manic or hypermanic episode um, and that really is much less researched so in general um, research and and 
and focus on bipolar disorder really does focus on these bipolar type 1 and bipolar type 2. And there are, there is, as you said, some other subtypes of bipolar, which um, might be that someone has very severe manic episodes, but they're very, very short, and yet they still have full episodes of depression. So it's still considered a bipolar disorder, but it would come under a term called not otherwise specified, which is then quite a messy group. And because of that is sort of not um, focused on as much in research. So in general, we're talking about bipolar type 1 and bipolar type 2. The DSM diagnoses are notoriously messy. But <laughs> going back to bipolar, how effective is lithium in treating bipolar? And how does that depend on the nature of the bipolar? Also, how does lithium compare to other mood stabilizing treatments? So lithium um, was first discovered as being very useful treatment for mania. Um, and in fact, it was really the first um, psychiatric medication um, to be found to be effective. This is all the way back in the 1940s. So we've known for a long time that lithium is useful for reducing those over-activated symptoms of mania. It was then later discovered that lithium is also useful for treating symptoms of depression. And so because of this, it was called a mood stabilizer because it both can bring down the, act the over-activated symptoms and bring up the under-activated symptoms. Um, and really, um, the other thing that has been found very strongly, perhaps more strongly than, than those two things I mentioned, is that if people are taking lithium and it's working well, if they continue to take lithium, the rates of relapse into another episode of mania or depression are hugely, hugely reduced. And that sort of, you know, makes sense and sounds maybe a bit straightforward. If you have an effective treatment, it can stop your symptoms coming back. But um, I would say that over many other treatments that are used for bipolar disorder, it, the evidence for that is much better for lithium. Um, we have lots of other treatments for bipolar disorder that are used. Some of them is today, particularly in the West, used more than lithium. So um, in general, there are a group of medications called antipsychotics, which in general are very good for treating mania, in general are not so good for treating depression or, or stopping relapse, particularly of depression. Um, and another group of treatments that are often used are anticonvulsants or treatments that are commonly used for epilepsy. And these, some of these are better at treating mania than depression, some are better at treating depression than mania, and often combinations of across all of those three types are used. And then, of course, we have antidepressants, which are used very frequently for depression, but for people with bipolar depression, although they may be useful at treating the depressive symptoms, they can actually in some cases, make the manic symptoms worse. So we have a lot of effective drugs for bipolar disorder, but most of those drugs are actually not effective for all of the key aspects of the illness, um, which is why I would suggest, and many people would say, that lithium is sort of still the gold standard for bipolar. And would you say that it's particularly helpful for bipolar 1, which has a larger manic component than bipolar 2? Um, there have been some studies that suggest that people with um by with many many episodes of bipolar um might be less likely to do well with lithium there there is a lot of evidence for bipolar 1 there's a lot of evidence for bipolar 2 it's effective for both but really um the the people with bipolar who might be less likely to do to do well with lithium are people who are having many episodes sort of anyway. Pick up on something that you mentioned, which is that lithium's not actually the most widely used mood stabilizing medication in some countries. And that's maybe in spite of the evidence. I came across a paper recently, just a review paper by Lars Kessing, who's at the University of Copenhagen. And Lars pointed out that only about a third of patients will 
ever use lithium now to manage bipolar. He also pointed out that the use has gone down in recent decades. Why do you think that is, given that we've got good safety and efficacy data in support of lithium? I think it's really interesting. Lithium has sort of got a bit of a bad name for itself. Um, and I think that this has become more um, sort of ingrained because these things get passed on. So I speak to psychiatrists sometimes who are young or early in their career um, who haven't really been taught a huge amount about lithium or certainly haven't been taught what I have been taught about lithium. Um, and I would say the main, so there is some stigma through clinicians, I will call it stigma, we'll talk about it in a minute, um, some stigma from patients. And so it sort of comes from, from different directions and that's the main reason. And the main reason for what I call here stigma is that in high doses, lithium is, in very high doses, lithium is toxic. So if your body absorbs too much, which might be because you've because of the dose and or because of your sort of metabolism, um, you can have toxic levels which can cause um, illness of the kidneys and or thyroid in particular. Um, and because of this, lithium needs to be carefully monitored. And we have good evidence that if lithium is carefully monitored and the levels of lithium in the blood are kept within a certain range or not above a certain range, um, that it is as safe as other medications. But in those higher levels, it can be unsafe. And so this is very worrying for people. Um, and there have been a couple of, um, you know, articles, people read things about bad experiences that people have had. Certainly in the UK, we also have difficulties within our health service, which mean that actually quite often people's lithium levels aren't monitored as well as they should be. So as regularly as they should be. Um, and that can be a worry. So perhaps if I was a doctor, um, seeing a patient that I thought would potentially benefit from lithium, but I know that the blood taking clinic is, you know, not working well, or there is a likelihood that that person isn't going to be monitored for safety as well as they should be. I might there be less likely to prescribe it, even though I think it's likely to work. Now, I'd like to come back to biomarkers later because I know that's a particular area of your expertise. Bipolar in some ways is quite similar to some other psychiatric conditions. So there's a large amount of overlap between bipolar and schizophrenia, for example. There have been studies that have looked at physicians' differential diagnoses and often one person would classify one individual as having bipolar and another physician would classify that person as having schizophrenia. There seems to be some shared genetic architecture that disposes people to both diseases. Some of the treatments that are used are similar and the trajectories of the different diseases also seem to mimic each other in some ways. So given all of that, you might suspect that lithium would be helpful for schizophrenia and maybe some other somewhat similar psychiatric conditions. So what about using lithium for schizophrenia? It's interesting that you say that. So yes, exactly. Um, schizophrenia is often thought of as the other sort of main mental illness, and there is some overlap. Um, however, it hasn't really been um, found to be effective for people with schizophrenia. And it's thought that that is mainly because lithium um, affects the mood symptoms rather than the more psychotic symptoms, which can be thought of as a bit of a dichotomy. So people who have bipolar disorder, who have more psychosis type symptoms, um, or symptoms more similar to schizophrenia, would possibly be taking or have found find lithium plus an antipsychotic or something to treat the more sort of psychosis symptoms. Um, and similarly, people with um, schizophrenia or psychosis illness who have, um, there are people who have a particularly affective or mood component 
which is often called schizoaffective disorder. Those people might be um, given lithium, might and that you know there are some studies that suggest that for the affective symptoms, lithium can be um, effective. But you're right, yeah, it's not used um, often in people with schizophrenia. Some people would describe schizoaffective disorder as more or less a more severe version of schizophrenia, just because you have the psychotic symptoms, so maybe seeing and hearing things that aren't there but also you have that stronger mood component. And so to manage both of those types of symptoms, these people are maybe more likely to have to use multiple medications. Possibly, yes, but using multiple medications is also very frequent in bipolar disorder. And I suppose maybe it's worth saying that across all of these three diagnoses that we're talking about, there's a huge amount of variability between people with the same diagnosis. So the experience of one person with schizoaffective disorder compared with one person who has bipolar disorder may be more or less severe in more or less different ways for more or less of the time. So I wouldn't, I don't think it perhaps is that useful to say, oh, people with schizoaffective disorder are more severely ill than people who have bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. And you mentioned that lithium is helpful for both poles, both the mania and the depression. That would suggest that it could have some antidepressant properties in people with major depression who don't have the manic episodes in which they're elated and they're full of energy and they barely sleep and they spend a fortune at the supermarket or the convenience shop. So what about lithium for major depression? Yeah, so um, that has some, is something that also has been looked at for quite a long time. Um, and for people who have major depression who haven't responded to the usual first common treatments of antidepressants. Um, there are only two or three, depending on which guidelines you look at, medications that are sort of recommended to be added to that antidepressant to, to improve the effect of antidepressants. And that's the main, lithium is one of them. Um, the other two are actually also um, medications that are used for bipolar disorder. So um, yes, absolutely, lithium is used, not hugely often, but we've done some work um, sort of really looking at long-term treatment of people with depression, non-bipolar depression, um, who would take lithium and found good effect. But it would rarely, if ever, be used as a monotherapy. Has it been studied in that way? It has been studied in that way and it has um, been found to be effective, but it's not used in that way. And that is primarily because we have many other treatments for depression, which are also considered to be effective and, you know, maybe don't require the monitoring that, that lithium does. Um, I would say that some of those studies have used slightly lower Lev um, doses of lithium than are used in bipolar disorder and for those you know I think that's an area that can be looked at more is whether for some people with non-bipolar depression slightly lower doses of lithium that have less risk for for any adverse physical effects could be a helpful alternative to um, other antidepressants. Now seems an opportune time to spell out what typical doses of lithium might be for a patient with bipolar. And then when you spoke about using lower doses for major depression, what kind of doses are we speaking about in that context? So the doses for bipolar disorder tend to start at three or even 600 milligrams of lithium carbonates. So in... Um, 200 milligrams of lithium carbonate, there is 37.5 milligrams of yeah. li lithium. Um, mm. So we are looking at levels that are above what I was talking about earlier as low dose in general. Mm. Um, but there are many psychiatrists now that I've spoken to who were saying, well, actually, I often will start patients at 150 milligrams. So that is a fairly low dose, um, see if they improve, see how much lithium is, is absorbed into the body, is detectable in the blood, and then sort of gradually go up from there. And this is something that generally hasn't been done in the research studies. 
And I think one of the reasons for that is that no one wants to do a research study where they use a dose that is too low and then that it's not found to be effective and everyone says, oh, this drug isn't effective. And so there is a bit of a lack of um, studies of lower doses of lithium um, and that is because for some people, lower doses of lithium won't be effective. For some people, they will be. And actually, we don't know who those people are before they start taking it. So I th that might be an important point. It really depends quite a lot on the individual as well as the diagnosis. This is tangential, but do you know of any ongoing research looking at that using what are called sequential multiple assignment randomized trials where you give people, say, a low dose to start with, and then after several weeks, you measure treatment responses, and you then maybe dichotomize people into responders or non-responders based on changing their symptoms. And with the non-responders, you then change their dose. So maybe initially they start with that 150 milligram carbonate dose, which is about 30 milligrams of elemental lithium. And then if they don't respond to that, then at the four week mark, that gets, say, doubled to 300 milligrams, twice the amount of elemental lithium. It's a really lovely study design, and I approve. To be completely honest, I don't know trials that have done that with lithium, and that definitely isn't to say that there haven't been any. And maybe you even know of some. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not hugely familiar, in all honesty. I haven't searched for them. I just mm. often look at this type of research and think, why don't you do that? I realized that logistically it's more of a pain in the ass and mm -hmm. there are some statistical headaches that come with that. Yeah. But when it comes to helping people outside of an experimental setting, that type of approach makes so much sense. And that could be yeah. applied in lots of different contexts, everything from helping someone with bipolar and looking at their dosing schedules of lithium to health coaching context where you give somebody an exercise training program and you realize that at the four week mark they're just not getting stronger and you need mm. to change something i suppose in a way it would depend for lithium on what the indication is so if someone is experiencing extremely severe mania it's not ethical to do that in a lot of ways mm. because being severely manic is a very risky state to be in and you have to reduce those symptoms as quickly as possible and then you can modify the dose and see what happens, which is harder in a research setting. For people with um, depression or to see what the effects of lithium in that way on depression would be, that could be a useful strategy. But actually, because for a lot of people, overall efficacy or benefit of lithium is actually only known after quite a long time because it may reduce depression or it may not reduce depression, but actually when you take it with something else, depression is reduced. And then you're looking, so we've just done a study, which is two year long study, to look at what happens in terms of the relapse rates and relapse prevention effects, which is something that you can't really, I guess, see with that kind of dose finding study because of the, the time period and the aim of treatment in that way. You spoke earlier about using lithium as an adjunct therapy in so-called treatment resistant depression. Somebody hasn't responded well to an SSRI or an SNRI and they're given lithium as an additional therapy and then their mood does respond. One of the issues with a lot of those antidepressants is that they take some time to kick in, several weeks for many of them. How quickly does lithium tend to exert its therapeutic effects? Is it something where you see a more or less immediate response or does it take a while to set in? It's fairly similar to many other treatments that are used for depression. Um, it may be a little bit quicker. So by four weeks after starting lithium, you would expect to see um, some changes. And there have been some reports of extremely, you know, within... I think four days or something, seeing some response. But in general, it you're looking over a month for some benefit and maybe two months for a, a more pronounced benefit, four to eight weeks. Do people 
tend to experience tolerance and withdrawal effects to one of the issues of many medications is that they take them over time and initially they have a strong response to them. But quickly, because of various different changes that take place in their physiology, they no longer get the type of response they initially enjoyed. And so you get dose escalation, which can come with all sorts of untoward effects. But also, if somebody then tries to either go cold turkey and stop taking the medication or taper, they get all sorts of withdrawal symptoms, some of which can be quite nasty. With lithium, do you see that type of tolerance and withdrawal? It's um, it's quite interesting in that, and this is actually the case with a lot of studies, it sort of depends what you measure and how you look at it. So there have been some studies that have suggested there aren't really any um, negative effects that come from tapering or withdrawal of lithium if it's done fairly fairly gradually. Um, there have been other studies that have, um, and with most drugs, it depends on many different factors, so it can be hard to tease apart what those are. And, you know, I don't think we have particularly, you know, we don't have as good an idea as we definitely should about, about the answer to that question. In terms of, you were said about... Um, Dose escalation, so the effect dropping off and requiring a higher dose. Um, that's something that, I, we, again, we don't have particularly strong um, evidence for, for lithium. We don't need to get deep into the weeds here, but can you give a high-level overview of some of the mechanisms by which lithium is thought to have these mood-stabilising effects in these different psychiatric conditions? Yeah, so... I mean, we know some things about this, and I guess most importantly, we know that the effects of lithium on the body and brain functions are quite complicated. So even though they've been studied a lot for a long time, there is a lot we don't know. A lot of that complexity comes from the fact that um, lithium can enter cells in the body, which men many substances can't do. And this can lead to communications between cells. Um, a lot of this happens in the brain. Um, so, for example, um, this sort of communication signaling can help increase substances that we know are beneficial for mental health. So um, serotonin, which people often call the sort of happiness signaling molecule, dopamine, which people of, often call the sort of reward signaling molecule in the brain um, and that signaling also um, changes the proteins that are responsible for cell growth and death so this is something that's relatively unique to lithium to be honest we see uh, more cell growth in general after people take lithium um, again particularly in the brain and that relates to what we call brain plasticity um, and that's also led to evidence of um, more gray matter or more sort of a bigger size perhaps of certain areas of the brain that are related to brain plasticity um and lithium can also potentially have effects on um down down regulating um overactive immune responses um because of all of those things together people often say lithium is neuroprotective and that maybe is related to what we were talking about earlier with the sort of um, health extension stuff. Now, I'll throw a couple more things in the mix. One is that there is some evidence that lithium can increase autophagy in the brain. Autophagy is your kind of waste disposal system, so clearing out junk that's accumulated as a byproduct of metabolism during activity. But then lithium seems to have quite potent effects on the circadian clock that regulates your roughly 24 hour rhythms in physiology mm. in an autonomous way and that's likely particularly helpful in bipolar because it's clear that the circadian rhythms of these people are quite disrupted and there's now been quite a lot of research showing that when people take lithium they have more regular rest activity rhythms and also if anything their rest activity rhythm tends to advance or shift earlier which in this particular context is especially helpful I mentioned that as a segue to biological rhythms and sleep, which is a subject that I'm particularly interested in. I'm pleased that there has actually been quite a lot of research on biological rhythms, but having a quick scan of the literature, 
it becomes clear that there hasn't been that much work on lithium and sleep and sleep architecture in recent years. From what I've seen early on, there was some work looking at things like electrophysiology. So what's going on in the brain in terms of electrical activity during sleep and how that might respond to lithium intake. But in recent decades, there's been relatively little of that, despite the fact that we know that many different affective disorders are associated with abnormalities in sleep architecture. Have you seen much recent work on the effects of lithium on sleep? And do you think any effects on sleep might mediate some of its mood stabilizing properties? Oh, that's very interesting. I mean, yeah, you're right um, about, about, about all of that. Um, and it is interesting. I think I suspect one of the reasons why it maybe hasn't been looked at to the same extent as what we might hope for, what could be beneficial is that a lot of um, medications for that are used for people with bipolar disorder are quite sedating. So um, they don't actually have that sort of the clock reset circadian effect as much as being a bit sedative and researchers sort of focus more on on that kind of thing and then but absolutely yeah I think it could be important to look more closely at specific aspects of sleep architecture and as you say whether early changes in sleep um, and circadian changes could could lead themselves to part of its therapeutic effect. And happily, it's much easier to look at biological rhythms and even sleep architecture outside of experimental settings nowadays. Wearables are getting better and better. And there are actually some head-worn wearables that will give some relatively good approximations of sleep, sleep architecture that people could use at home. So yes. I wonder if there is a research project there upcoming. But I mentioned that in part because the little research that I've come across suggested that when people take lithium, they have more total slow wave sleep or deep sleep. They also have a longer REM sleep latency. So it takes them longer after first falling asleep to enter REM sleep. That's particularly interesting to me because one of the common sleep phenotypes in major depression is very short REM latency and also relatively more REM sleep in total. And that's often a response to the history of REM sleep loss, because if you look at the time course of changes in sleep architecture, as somebody goes from not having depression to depression, then one of the trajectories that you might see is that initially there's sleep fragmentation late in the sleep period. So somebody has very early awakenings and then that forebodes a lapse in mood. And when they do then enter the grip of depression, often people seem to sleep slightly more and they have more REM sleep and they enter it sooner. So anything that could delay first entry to REM sleep and increase non-REM sleep is likely to be beneficial. And it's thought that this is one of the ways that exercise exerts its antidepressant effects. And there has been some work showing that changes in sleep probably do mediate a substantial chunk of the antidepressant effects of exercise. And so given that that initial work points to the actions of lithium on sleep mimicking the actions of exercise, which is exactly what we would want for someone with major depression. I just think there's a missed opportunity here where there's so much ongoing research and it's quite easy to study sleep nowadays and not many people are looking at that. Yeah, I think um, part of that, so you alluded to this thing about um, at-home wearables so that you can measure sleep. In, in people's natural environment, which is, um, could, as you say, be a huge, huge improvement on all of our old sleep studies where people had to basically come into hospital and sleep in this artificial environment. And that, that obviously changes what you see. Um, some of my colleagues at the moment are actually doing a, a study looking at, um, sleepy, sleep EEG. Um, with an at home and <laughs> all I really know about this at the moment, we're looking at the effects of a cognitive remediation intervention on some sleep markers. Actually, we're still fairly early in that journey. So we're still 
a lot of the devices are still not hugely easy <clears throat> for participants to use. Um, and I'm talking about those that are quite high grade in terms of, you know, what, what we can look at. You're shaking your head and I think you're, you're probably saying, actually, it's really easy, but I guess it depends on what devices and no. we're very slow in academia. <laughs> so it takes us a long time to work out how to do things. But once no, we do, there's a huge opportunity there. Sorry. Yeah, go for it. I've spent a lot of time speaking on other podcasts as a guest, throwing various different wearables under the bus and I see all the limitations of the wearables and I see all the limitations of polysomnography too. PSG being the gold standard way of assessing sleep. Just as one example of this, they had a group of patients with epilepsy and overnight they had two electrodes monitoring electrical activity in the brain. One of them was actually deep within the brain in the hippocampus and then one of them was the surface electrode over the scalp over the frontal cortex. And they had people independently score the patterns of electrical activity in the brain at those two sites over the course of the night. They didn't know what was going on at the other site. And then they mapped the electrical activity at those two sites next to each other. And what they found was that over the course of the night, about a third of the time, the two sites of the brain were scored as being in discrete sleep or wake stages. So at one point in time, part of the brain might be showing wake-like behavior and another part of the brain might be scored as being in N2 sleep, for instance. And so that calls into question a lot of the research that's come previously using polysomnography because we know that sleep isn't some sort of single state where all of the brain is in the same state at once. And this likely explains various different strange phenomena that take place during sleep, like sleepwalking, lucid dreaming, many other phenomena too. So I am not saying by any means that you just need to give everybody a dream to headband and then take whatever data you get out of those headbands and assume that that's precisely what's going on in the brain. But even if these devices are imperfect, I think that they can still be helpful research tools. And we've seen that with the data on rest activity rhythms, which are often relatively crude, just using actimetry where you're looking at somebody's motion mm. and then using that to assess the stability of people's rhythms and the timing and so on. But the devices are definitely getting better over time. And so given there's been this paucity of research, I just think that there's a real research opportunity there. And we all have our biases and, and my bias is that sleep does a lot of work in the background and much of that work has been neglected to date in the same way that lithium has been somewhat neglected. So I like to take those two neglected fellows and, and put them together and see a bit more research looking at both of them. I'd like to transition to the potential of lithium as an anti-aging or longevity molecule. And this is not your area of expertise, but I do see you as being an expert in lithium. And so I'm still keen to know your thoughts. The way that I first became interested in this was through a guy named Michael Risto. Have you come across his work? No. So he's a German scientist. And I first learned of his work during my undergrad because he published some brilliant work looking at the effects of high doses of vitamin C and vitamin E around exercise, showing that if you take those around exercise, then we basically blunt people's adaptations to the exercise because mm. the exercise generates oxidative stress and that's important to things like remodeling mitochondria in response to the exercise. But for whatever reasons, he's had a keen interest in lithium over the years. And he did some preclinical work a few years ago showing that if you feed lithium to various different animals, then you can actually extend their lifespan. He's done some other work looking at things like the UK Biobank, which is this very large scale data repository where mm -hmm. all sorts of information is collected on hundreds of thousands of adults in the UK each year. And he did some work where he took that data set and looked at people's medical records too, and then looked at individuals with psychiatric conditions and the risk of 
their passing away in years to come from various different diseases. And what he found was that the psychiatric patients who were taking lithium had a much lower risk of dying from all causes combined. Their risk was about 3.6 times lower than it was had they been using other medications. And so when you couple that with his preclinical experiments, there's an interesting signal there. What do you think might be going on here, if anything? That's really interesting because um, there have been other studies, many other studies that have looked at mortality um, rates in treated, uh, lithium treated versus lithium untreated um, people with affective disorders and and have shown similar findings, but they sort of have often mainly attributed that to um, death by suicide, whereas actually it, it's not just death by suicide. And I think that comes back to um, a lot of the things I was saying about the effects of lithium that seem to be neuroprotective. Um, and one of those effects that I hadn't mentioned um, was is some similar type of work in humans looking at telomeres which are basically the, the bit on the ends of genes that as we get older sort of broadly wear away and they're used as one of our main bio markers of biological aging um, and people who take lithium have have tended to show more um essentially protection on telomeres than people over time who haven't taken lithium so that's what that sort of provides maybe a mechanism for some of that some of those findings as well there are these so-called hallmarks of aging telomere shortening is one of the main hallmarks of aging along with a few other things that i think lithium probably does target like chronic inflammation and possibly stem cell exhaustion i know there's some work looking at stem cell populations in some parts of the brain and how those might respond in vivo to lithium exposure and so on. And then I mentioned autophagy as well. And this regulated macro autophagy is another of the hallmarks of aging. So it could be that lithium is actually targeting several of these different hallmarks. And my impression is that that's especially true of the brain. You spoke mm. earlier about how lithium can enter cells. It can enter cells throughout the body. But to me, the most compelling evidence is in favor of lithium having anti-aging effects in the brain, specifically mm. when we look at its effects in various different psychiatric conditions, but also neurodegenerative ones, as we might get to later. If we put the lifespan experiments to the side, and the lifespan experiments haven't been a home run, like Linda Partridge, Dame Linda Partridge, who's a, I think UCL in London, did some work looking at mice finding that lithium didn't extend lifespan, but it did improve some proxies of health span, like the mice had slightly better body composition. It seemed that the male mice responded slightly better than female mice. And that's often the case in this type of research. One sex responds differently to the other sex. So even if there isn't that effect, for me, the thing that's especially interesting in the case of lithium is its potential anti-suicide effects. And we see that in clinical populations. So, of course, if you look at people who attempt to commit suicide or commit suicide, a disproportionately large number of those people have been diagnosed with psychiatric conditions. And if they're taking lithium, then that's hopefully going to help with those conditions and reduce the risk of suicide. But as you alluded to early on, there also seems to be some association between lithium levels in the drinking water in various different places and the risk of people committing suicide, but also engaging in some other types of violent behavior. And so given that targeting suicide, certainly nutritionally, seems to be especially tricky, that to me is very interesting. So what do you think about the relationships between drinking water levels and suicide risk specifically? I know early on, you mentioned in passing that there are some important caveats to consider. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's just fascinating, isn't it? I can't, you know, I've thought about it quite a lot and I haven't really been able to come up with something that explains 
very clearly what this association might be. You know, for example, if it's true that the places in the world that have high levels of lithium are also more, um, you know, have less deprivation, then that could be a factor. But we we have tried to look at that data or all of the data that we have on various things that could be explaining that association and we haven't been able to explain it. The caveat that I mentioned is that we really don't have almost any studies that have looked at an individual level. So what these studies tend to do is they say in this area of Texas, the lithium levels are X and in this area of Texas, the lithium levels are Y. In the in the first area, the suicide rate overall is X and the suicide rate in the other area is Y. And that tells you an overall group effect, but that doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't, you can't then say, me as an individual, if I live here rather than here, I'm less likely to die by suicide. Um, and it's really hard to get that data or to kind of get some more granularity there. Um, interestingly, there was a study done by Lars Kessing, who you mentioned earlier in Copenhagen, who looked, um, at a, a more of an individual level. So he looked, I think, at sort of database information around um, places where people resided, and the lithium levels there, and dementia rates. And that was, there was slightly more likelihood that you could sort of extrapolate from that to an individual level. But it's still really hard, especially because suicide rates are relatively low as an event. They're not as high as... Um, you know, people going on holiday or something. So that also makes it a bit harder. It would be really helpful if there was a biomarker of long-term exposure to lithium. Do we have such a biomarker where we can look at the concentration of something, say, in somebody's blood, and we could say that on average they have likely been consuming this much lithium in recent times, the same way that we can look at somebody's HbA1c, and we can say that in the last 115 days, someone's blood sugar level has probably been roughly this. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, so I, you know, we know that lithium has effects on lots of different things that we can measure in the body, including genetic and epigenetic markers, but those effects are not specific enough. So um, we can measure people's lithium levels at a single point in time. And some, there have been a few studies that have done this and people not taking lithium looked using a very high sensitivity test at levels of lithium, very low trace levels of lithium in people's blood at any one time. And, you know, you can see that people who are likely to consume more of the more cereals or things that come from the ground, more drinking water in places with high levels, you could see that they might have higher levels, but only at that moment, right? Yeah, and like you say, there are so many potential issues at play. There's probably some so-called residual confounding where you can try to statistically adjust for everything that could confound the relationship between tap water levels and suicide risk, but you're not gonna get it all. Then there's the issue of what's going on at the level of the individual as opposed to the level of the population. And where are they getting their water from? Are they drinking mineral water from Argentina when they live in Scotland? Probably not, but still, still it is something to consider. I mentioned neurodegenerative diseases earlier and the idea that if lithium is having neuroprotective effects, then it could be particularly helpful in the context of some of these conditions. And there's been a little bit of work looking at low doses of lithium in Alzheimer's patients. I came across that because you were the first author on what I thought was an excellent systematic review looking at the effects of low dose lithium in various different brain related conditions. So what do you think about the potential of lithium both as a preventive intervention against the possible development of dementia, somebody just experiencing mild cognitive dysfunction, they constantly forget where they put their keys, they're struggling to bring to mind the right word, even though it's on the tip of the tongue, mm. but also 
in the case of somebody who already has developed some form of dementia, it could be Alzheimer's, but it could be something else. What about lithium as something to halt the progression of that disease? Yeah, this is an area that I'm really interested in. And there have been, so there have been four or five um, trials, clinical trials of lithium in these types of population. Um, and really the interesting thing is that, so some of those were for people, like you said, who already had um, Alzheimer's disease. Some of them were people who had more sort of prodromal states, so uh, mild cognitive impairment. Some of them were at higher doses, some of them were at lower doses. And actually, there didn't, there doesn't really seem to be a huge, there was a benefit found overall um, across those trials, although in some of them it was fairly small, but the benefit doesn't look to me like it's related to dose. So I think you it would be possible to use lithium at low doses and trial that. Um, and also dependent on whether that it was established or sort of pre-dementia phases. Um, one of those studies was actually for four for a four year period, and it looks like possibly the effect grows over time. So for me, what would be really interesting and a very expensive study <laughs> would be to have you know you really want to see um the effect of in my opinion a low dose of lithium from earlier on you know what what people might call normal cognitive decline in aging um and really look over a very long period and that would sort of mimic in a way um mimic but enhance in a way the sort of environmental lithium stuff so one of the reasons why there might be a suicide reduction in people who live in um, areas with higher environmental lithium is that sort of longevity of exposure that's something that's really hard to find out but would be really beneficial in finding out in this area as well there was one particular study of alzheimer's patients who were given low trace dose of lithium carbonate is I think 300 micrograms each day. So we're talking about a level that's maybe a hundred times lower than what some people are taking for bipolar. Took that each day for 15 months. And the people who took the lithium didn't have any additional deterioration in their cognitive function, according mm. to a particular scale that they used, the many mental state examination, which is why we, mm -hmm. whereas people in the placebo condition did get worse over that mm. time. And something to point out is that the development of drugs against the advancement of dementia and Alzheimer's has been completely hopeless. People have spent an absolute fortune on it. So you spoke about the study being expensive and we could have something that's been used in psychiatry for as long as pretty much anything else sat right in front of us that could be helpful in this context. And today it's remain relatively neglected. It could be that trace doses are, are better than higher doses. This is something that I've heard Thomas Cattuso mention in passing in discussing some of his work on Parkinson's patients. I know he thinks that some of the work that was done on lithium early on used doses that are too high. Mm. And actually for those patients, lower doses might be better. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about the prospect of lithium in some of these other neurodegenerative conditions, such as Parkinson's? I think, I mean, it's very much not my area, but um, the, there have been a few studies, like you say, in Parkinson's. Um, I think there was one Huntington's disease, one in um, ALS, and the, there is something there, possibly. Some of the evidence, I think, has suggested that actually it might be a sort of um effect specifically on certain symptoms like agitation um that that might be causing a possible benefit but obviously given everything we talked about with you know neuroprotection and that kind of thing neuroplasticity it seems it seems possible and like you say if it's on the doorstep it would be good to try it i think anything that is promoting neuroplasticity in general is probably going to be a helpful adjunct intervention. 
provided that it's safe and well tolerated and trace doses of lithium most likely are. Thomas Gattuso brings up the subject of different forms of lithium. So citrate and carbonate are used clinically. They are FDA approved medications, but there are various salts of lithium that you can buy over the counter in some countries, not the UK, although it's easy enough to source lithium products like Orate from elsewhere. You can just get them imported in from the States. But there are others like oxybutyrate and salicylate and several more. It's not very clear to me which of these might be best because this is an instance where it seems that some of the early work was on carbonate. And then after that, all of the work was on carbonate. And people haven't done a very good job at trying to systematically tease apart which of these might be best in different contexts. And it could be that one of the forms that's used as a dietary supplement is superior to the forms that have been mainstays of treating bipolar for decades. So could you tell us about the recent study that you did that used one of these products? I think you used the Swanson five milligram lithium orotate product, which is a product that I've taken myself personally. And also what you make of some of these different salts. Yes, exactly. Um, Swanson, actually you can buy from Swanson's own UK website. I have no oh. conflict of interest there. Um, <laughs> But yes, we that's that is what we used um in our study and we did um I have to credit here Dr. David Cousins who is you should have got on this podcast instead of me, so he's wonderful. <laughs> um in Newcastle. Um and they actually looked at a number of different um lithium orotate products in the scanner and looked at the amount of lithium that was there and how stable it seemed to be across different tablets and Swanson was pretty good. Um, okay. But what we what we did in that study was um, we gave people lithium orotate for 28 days and we did a brain scan after varying amounts of time. And that was because we wanted to see whether we could measure levels of lithium in the brain, which is a fairly new technique in general. It's been done it you can see uh lithium that's got into the brain and people taking high doses of lithium um which is good because it means that it is getting there like we think from all of the research that's been done before but we really had no idea if you could detect um or even what happened in the brain if people took five milligrams of lithium only um and it was really quite exciting that we were able to see that and that sort of does suggest to me that there is potentially benefit of taking lithium at these doses. Thomas Catuzzo has been using lithium aspartate and in a tiny pilot trial that he did of Parkinson's patients that flagged some potential on a biomarker that they look at as a proxy of treatment responses. They in that study also had a lithium carbonate arm and Surprisingly, I think that their data suggested that 45 milligrams of lithium aspartate might be more potent than 150 milligrams of lithium carbonate. But then alongside that research, there are preclinical data suggesting that lithium orotate might be the pick of the bunch in terms of potency, but also toxicity. You chose lithium orotate what was your rationale for choosing well we chose lithium orotate because um broadly because it's the most widely available it seems to be the most um commonly used supplement form of lithium yeah. although lithium aspartate also is very common but actually although there were other studies done a while ago that sort of looked at some different forms of lithium mm -hmm. compared them and generally didn't find a huge difference or really much difference that hasn't been done with lithium orotate yet and um, it's something that we'd really like to do Dave and I've been talking about trying to get funding to, to do that and look really properly because as you said there there has been some suggestion that lithium orotate might be um, basically more bioavailable and that is possibly um, because of 
the way that uh, lithium orotate affects or erotic acid, which is the bit that goes with the lithium, affects the um, transport of particles between cells. Maybe it makes there be more intracellular signaling. Um, but this is not, this hasn't really been sort of proven. We don't really know. Something that What's is space? important to find out. Yeah, exactly. Realize now that due to our very punchy rapid fire round, the clock is running down. <laughs> we don't have that much time left, but hopefully you've got enough time for a few more questions just to cover some fundamentals. And one of them is regarding lithium timing, like therapeutic doses, the kinds of doses that are used in bipolar. Lithium can be a bit soporific, it can make people feel a bit sleepy, and that's one of the reasons that it tends to be taken in the evening. Do you think that if somebody is taking a trace dose of lithium, they should be at all concerned about the time of day at which they take it? I think if we're talking about a trace dose, it would very likely not matter when it was taken. Um, one of the other reasons why lithium at higher doses um, is thought to be better at night is because the um, kidneys filter lithium more slowly at night, so you might get a more. Um, but... There is also, you know, there's huge argument or debate about whether people should take lithium more than once a day or only once a day. So in some areas, people will suggest that um, one dose is taken in the morning and one at night, which would theoretically keep the levels more stable over time as a whole. Um, but actually, some of the evidence, there's, there is evidence to suggest that taking lithium once a day at night um, is better for the kidneys because essentially you get um, they have a bit of a break <laughs> in between and that might be there's no evidence really for that at lower doses though lithium is a so-called chronobiotic it's something that can change the different parameters of the circadian clock its phase its amplitude and possibly its period as well and so when you take it could affect the clock if the dose means that the action of lithium is fast enough to not spill over into different portions of the biological day. If you've got something that's got a very slow half-life, then if it's in your system round the clock, it's not likely to affect your circadian clock. That could actually be relevant to these different salts of lithium. If the salt dramatically affects the half-life, then that could have some real therapeutic implications. I hadn't thought of that previously but that's just a hypothesis that's maybe worth considering. But you mentioned the kidneys there, and we can use that to bring us to the safety of lithium. There are some real concerns about toxicity at high doses for long periods. And one of these relates to renal function, but other people have pointed to some possible negative effects on thyroid function too, and possibly a couple of other untoward effects. So what do you think about the safety of lithium relative to other medications for, let's say, bipolar? It's really important to be aware of the benefits and the adverse effects of medications in general and know what those are, what the risks are, how severe the risks are, how common the risks are and, and, and how they differ. With lithium, there are there is a need to monitor renal kidney function and there is evidence that if that is done properly and that the levels are kept within a certain window um, that the safety is much better the likelihood of renal problems are much lower and um, with similar with thyroid function thyroid um, function can be controlled so there are for a lot of the side effects there are things that can be done that in turn don't seem to have negative effects um, so one of the things about lithium is that people often need to um, urinate more frequently and there are things that can be done to manage that. So it's important to know what the risks are for people to be able to monitor and have conversations and, and know what can be done to minimise or manage those risks. Um, and there are risks also, as you said, with other medications for bipolar disorder um, and they differ between the different medications. So I don't want to give you the side effect profile of every different type, but it it really is always a case of pros and cons. And 
I would say that's the same with many medications for many different physical as well as mental health conditions as well. And would you say there are any absolute contraindications to using lithium? So you take someone who's got chronic kidney disease. Does that mean that they couldn't take lithium for their bipolar? Are there any conditions that just rule out the use of lithium entirely? There are there are several conditions that um, make lithium not a great idea. And certainly end-stage renal disease, it probably isn't a great idea um, to take lithium. <laughs> Well, it definitely isn't a great idea, but um, in all scenarios, really, it is about balancing risks and benefits and management. Um, there are, but as you said, yeah, there are a number of contraindications or um, conditions that make lithium not a great idea. There are also some medications that you shouldn't really take while on lithium because they change the. Um, you know, they can make your levels go up or down. Interestingly, things like caffeine and smoking also affect lithium levels. And, and these are things that, if people are aware of them, can also actually mitigate some of the risks. And what about the birth control pill? And I'm thinking about a, a tenuous connection to the question I had in mind, which is just whether there are any differences between the biological sexes in how they respond to lithium. Do men and women respond much the same way? Um, I don't know. I think, <laughs> I mean, I think um, there, there have been studies that have found differences in response to various treatments between genders. Um, the, that may differ depending on whether you're looking at a cognitive effect or a mood effect or a suicide effect or an aggression effect um, of lithium. And essentially, if there is evidence for these different things, it's not strong enough to make a difference. So if two people that are otherwise identical but differ in gender go to a clinic and are being considered for lithium, it's not going to make a difference. And then final question, at roughly what level of lithium in terms of milligrams of elemental lithium per day would you start to question the need to do additional testing under the hood to ensure that somebody isn't experiencing any negative effect. When you say additional testing, do you mean monitoring of the lithium levels? Yeah, and, and maybe monitoring of things like renal function, anything that could respond negatively to the lithium. Because I thought of this recently. I have a colleague who is friends with a relatively well-known so-called biohacker who takes a very large dose of lithium orotate. And I thought to myself, you're not trying to manage bipolar disorder and you're doing this off your own back and you're taking tens of milligrams, not that far shy of a hundred milligrams of lithium orotate each day. I'm not sure that's a good idea. I think you mentioned earlier, Aura, we looked at all of the studies that had treated with people, treated people with low low dose lithium or microdose and not high dose lithium um, and in all of those studies there were there weren't adverse risks that were that were reported now not all of those studies were monitoring um lithium levels thyroid function renal function and such but i would say from the low dose and below in general there may not be a need for monitoring but actually, there hasn't. Be, we need a little bit more evidence, really, to to test that. And I think there are just now some studies coming out looking at um, renal function in high versus low dose lithium carbonate treated people. But this is still actually not something that's been um, looked at in low doses. A huge amount. Just thinking about dietary supplements that people might buy off the shelves. And they're mm. typically 10 milligrams or lower. Mm. So do you think at, at that type of dose, there's no real cause for concern? If somebody wanted to piggyback on your research and go and buy some Swanson lithium orotate, five milligrams a day, and then take that indefinitely, should they have any cause for concern? Given the fact that orotate might be relatively more bioavailable, it might not be the same as consuming five milligrams from drinking water. Is there any potential issue there? It's true. So what I would say is, A, there is no evidence for there being an issue there. 
but actually yeah. this is something that so I'm just about to begin a study with lithium orotate um, where we will give people up to 20 milligrams of lithium orotate for up to six months and we will be looking at this stuff because no one's looked at it before so if you ask me again in 18 months hopefully I'll be able to actually answer that yeah that sounds good and there were lots of things that I wanted to discuss with you today we got just about halfway through the list of subjects that I had in mind because I wanted to now transition to speaking about your other work everything from biomarkers of treatment responses to the cognitive remediation work that you're doing in patients with bipolar some of your teaching activities and more but we will have to leave it there so I'll just say thank you very much for your time today it's been a pleasure meeting you and is there anywhere that you'd like to direct listeners in terms of following your work or anything like that? If people are interested in um, in our work or in the work that I've been talking about, they can maybe Google the Centre for Affective Disorders, which is where I work at the um, Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London, which even though is shorter than reading out my email address is still very long. <laughs> so, but yeah, thank you so much, Greg. And I'm um, sorry that my answers, particularly to the quick fire questions, have meant that we didn't get through everything. That's right. I, I think if you ask me for a quick fire response, I'd probably give you a 10 minute monologue. So I will I forgive you. I got better you. as we went through though. You did. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>